Good evening, everyone. I've just been told I'm allowed to start, that it's now the right time. Yes, it's on. We are recording tonight because we're hoping to start a series of uh, YouTube recordings with the Hocken and also I think podcasts was the idea that started it, but I'm not sure whether we're up to that yet. Um, but I hope you enjoy this evening. But it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Emily Duncan to you. And to you. <laughs> this is my clicker. Uh, <laughs> Emily has contributed majorly in the last year and a half to our work as our award winner for 20, I was going to say 19, but 2023. And she was our third award winner. And I think we have had a lot of benefit from and a lot of interest from the work she's done. And it makes me think, I was trying to think today that there was a statement about at the last play um, reading about for Culp and how the ideas develop from that, but a lot of you didn't stay for the questions and answers, and it was really interesting. But I also thought Shakespeare had something to say about this, as you like it. All the world's a stage, and men and women merely players. And I think you'll see from what Emily has to tell us that this is very relevant, that we all play parts, and that's the essence of of what the play reading has been about. And today we're pleased to hear about the other treasures that you've discovered that we haven't heard about. And this is the value of archives to show us aspects of the past and possibly give us indications towards the future because things seem to turn around in a 30 year cycle. So maybe in 30 years, you have another turn at this sort of thing, but I won't be there to see it. So all the best with the future, but we're looking forward to what you've got to tell us today. Thank you very much. Yeah. Coco, thank you very much for that um, introduction and thank you for the opportunity to be able to speak to you this evening. Um, not just about this project, but also I'll be talking a bit about my work as a playwright slash dramaturg. So I hope they all demystify some of that process. I realised while Louise was doing the introduction that I hadn't included in my talk um, anything about this particular slide, which was chosen quite purposely. So that's a little research failure on my front. Does anyone want to hazard to guess what this slide might be from? I read where it was from. Oh, yeah, actually, it would have been, I think, in the, the promo materials. Yes. Well, clearly it's the kitchen type area. It's Savoy. Yeah, it's, it's the Savoy. So um, the, the focus of this talk was sizing and serving up establishment is around how I decided what would go into the piece and what form it would go into the piece and some of the things I ended up putting aside. And somewhat ironically in relating to this image is I had initially resisted including the Savoy for the main reason being the Savoy has been around for so long and so many people have connections with it. I was sort of at a loss as to, well, where would I start? How would I approach it? And then one day, it was about I don't know, April last year, um, Anna Peterson, yes, from upstairs, emailed me and said, uh, just FYI, uh, we've just obtained these glass plate negatives of the Savoy from the 1930s, if I remember correctly, the scene isn't set then. And so I I went along upstairs and Anna laid them out with a light box and I very, very nervously and carefully placed each one on the light box. And I was really struck by there being so many images that captured behind the scenes work of people working in the kitchens because that's not ordinarily uh, what you 
is recorded of any sort of dining establishment. The slide wasn't used in the establishment slides, but so that's one of the reasons it's here. So yeah, that's some of the kitchen. Okay, so as I said, I'm going to talk about some of my approach to the project. I approach this very much equal parts with my playwright hat on and my dramaturg hat on. Is anyone familiar with the term dramaturg? Want to kind of guess what it means? Yes. 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 <laughs> Be brave. Please. Yeah. I know what Alistair MacDonald used to do okay. in the Globe, so mm -hmm. that's my mm -hmm. experience of it. Yes, and he seemed to assess what was developing. I don't know what sort of advice he gave. He wasn't the person to prompt people, um, but, yeah, that's about all I know about it. Yeah, that's one way of working. Anyone else? Martin, you've worked with a dramaturg. <laughs> A dramaturg is a script advisor, a screenplay advisor, um, a dramatic consult consultant. Yeah, so there are different ways of approaching it. There's a more, and a dramaturg can do both, and they should sort of have skill sets in both areas. Um, work more like Alistair, where it's a more, I would say, literary focus, and he would write quite comprehensive program notes on the various um, productions, which has created a wonderful record of all these Fortune productions over the years. Someone please write that history. Um, and then you have, was that a knowing laugh? Is it happening? <laughs> um, then you have dramaturgs who probably work more like myself, where I work alongside the playwright in a more hands-on way with the production or with the playwright <coughs> as part of the development process. And I ended up doing my PhD with a focus on dramaturgy because it's something I'd wanted to do since I first heard about it, what a dramaturg was in 1999. and thought that's what I want to do when I grow up, but there isn't any way to really qualify as a dramaturg in New Zealand. There are no specific training programs or qualifications or such like. So that's why I did my PhD with that focus. Um, we actually all perform acts of dramaturgy, if you um, believe it or not, because in its simplest forms, dramaturgy is the action through which meaning is created by the recognition and arrangement of patterns. When you're putting together any story, with a dramaturgical lens on, you are looking at the patterns that help convey the story. So a very obvious pattern for establishment, and I put this in my application, is that it would be a series of monologues. So that lays out a pattern that the audience can follow. Um, yes, it developed into some being duologues, but that was the overall pattern. Part of the pattern was that it was going to span over the 20th century. Then when I got down to doing the research and writing, a pattern decision I had to make was, how am I going to order the different uh, monologues? Do I do it chronologically or do I do it some other way? And I know uh, I talked about this after the first read through, so some people might know this. Is there anyone else who uh, came to one of the readings might want to guess it's subtle why they were organized the way they were? <laughs> okay, so they're actually organised chronologically over a day. Yeah, so they'd start in the morning and go into the early hours of the next day um, outside Big Daddy's and the Oxygen. Another focus of my PhD, which was I was um, researching and writing about a site in the Maniatoto, and I'm going to talk about approaches to site in a moment, um, that was a tuberculosis sanatorium and uh, a ball stall and is now a privately owned and run um, Christian community. And under definition by sociologist Irvin Goffman, these would all qualify as total institutions and also sites that could be deemed 
uh, heterotopia by Michelle Foucault. I'll get on to that in a minute, and you don't have to worry too much about it. But it's also an approach for writing historical fiction. I'm going to, this is what I want to be present. Um, Jerome de Groot, who is at um, the University of Manchester, and he writes about um, contemporary consumption of historical fiction. He invites people to think of novels or films or plays or games or TV series, not as a poor, not as poor versions of history, not within a binary wherein they are the, at the margins of centrifugal historical culture, nor as parasites on proper historical knowledge and practice, but as establishing modes of historical awareness, engagement, narrativization, and comprehension. And one of my real heroes of writing um, historical fiction is not that he might this. Mm -hmm. uh, Hilary Mantel. So um, historical fiction is the threshold of where private and public history meet. If you have other feelings about Dame Hilary Mantel, this is not the time and place. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when I started uh, the research last year, whenever I start work on a project, I like to have a sort of a reading and viewing diet that complements it. So I went back and read the Wolf Hall um, trilogy. Not that I'm holding myself up to be James. Yeah. Uh, we're now going to touch on briefly heterotopia and Irving Goffman's um, theories around uh, performance in everyday life. Okay, so heterotopia, something like counter sites, a kind of enacted utopia in which real sites, all the other real sites that can be found within the culture, are simultaneously represented, contested, and inverted. Places of this kind are outside all places, even though it may be possible to indicate their location and reality. Before your heads spin, what do you need to know? Um, heterotopia take... Utopia is their reference, but they are real sites. They exist in all cultures. Uh, heterotopia means of another place, essentially. There's a medical, um, well, originally it was a medical term, so something that ends up in the body where it's not meant to be. Um, they There are uh, various principles that go with it, such as how people arrange their different roles within the heterotopia, uh, a process of um, exiting and entering. This is where a restaurant is a good example of heterotopia, because unlike your kitchen at home, you can't just walk in there and open up the fridge and help yourself. If you're being served at a table and you feel like a glass of juice, you can't just walk into the kitchen and help yourself. Um, it's, it's a performative site as well. Um, Irving Goffman is a sociologist. He examines social roles as performances that are determined by our interactions and routines. Individuals have many motives for trying to control the impression they perceive of the situation. Performances are influenced by situations and circumstances, including those in public dining settings and can be read and written as such. Goffman used the metaphor of theatre a lot in his work and wrote about people having roles. But this doesn't mean that there's something um, false or made up. Is it not, they're not taking on a role, you know, as, say, if you're performing in Lady Windermere's fan or something like that. It's acknowledging in different domains in our lives we behave differently. So, for example, while I'm standing here, I am Emily Duncan, PhD, doing a presentation. When I go home and my partner who does all the cooking serves me dinner, I am Emily who needs to be fed. You know, it's quite a different thing. My PhD has no currency for that situation, okay? Um, one of the things we look at with Goffman's total institutions, in a total institution who he terms the inmates, so the patients at a tuberculosis, tuberculosis sanatorium, they have limited autonomy over how they control the different parts of their, their days. You know, it's like when you're in hospital, you get served your lunch at a certain time, someone takes your blood at a certain time, you sit in that bed with that robe on. Um, and we sort of 
um, what's the word? You know, we work together to take on these sort of status shifts that might seem a bit weird elsewhere, but in that setting, it's normal. Uh, there's a, there's a, if you are more interested in this, um, Ian Hacking, who was a little lecturer in philosophy at the University of Toronto, he, uh, he died last year, but he has written an article that's published in 2015, um, which places Foucault and Goffman side by side, although on top of each other. He says it was complementary and that Foucault is like top-down institutions, power structures, whereas Goffman is more concerned with social interactions. Okay, that's not theory for now. Oh, and putting this all together, all my um, PhD baggage and looking at thinking about restaurants, I thought, hey, this is a good um, bag of tricks for creating some drama. Okay, now I'm going to get on to some of the literal sort of slicing and serving up and what I decided to put in there and not. This, yeah, can you see this? When we did. Okay, so it's the the lady. I tried to be all fancy with the slides. Thank you, Yes, um, but sometimes when you're fancy, it doesn't make it clear. But, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I was looking at the anniversary dinner was at the Monticello Hall. However, I was looking at this ladies' brass band group in relation to the Vedic. Somehow, I come across that they would regularly or semi-regularly meet there. And to balance things out, I wanted a group of women dining together. Yeah. And here in the Hocken, there's a whole lot of photographs, are they year photographs of the, the brass band ladies? Um, which isn't really much dramatic fuel. And then I looked at the menus, oh, corn meat, chicken, <laughs> peas, pavlovas, <laughs> nuts and cakes. Okay. What if I look at the music? Because I'd already put in my application, the plan from the start, I wanted music throughout. Okay. Maybe there's, maybe there's something to be found in their music. Um, no shade on anyone. I, I went through some of their music lists and listened to it, and I I just I couldn't find a way I could comfortably coexist with any of this while I was doing um, this research. I'm just brass band music isn't really for me, so <laughs> it's not particularly complex. So I said, no, nah, unless I really have a gap I need to fill, I'm afraid the ladies' brass band. Think we'll have to get aside and someone else can cover that in other history. Okay. Uh, <laughs> the British Public Schools Club. Is anyone familiar with this before you encountered every day of the establishment? <laughs> um, no, but I looked it up. Oh, okay. <laughs> what did you find? I thought it was. I, I mean, I just thought that it's such an, 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 an anachronism. Yeah, in New Zealand, it was, yeah. Yeah. Really bizarre. It was interesting, though. It was interesting, though. Yeah. I was yeah. talking to Louise and Claire yeah. um, beforehand about a school I attended. <laughs> um, so I attended a private school for a while, which is Alcohol Public School. And whenever you come to writing about whatever, especially in writing drama, you have to be conscious of what your attitude is to a character or a group <laughs> and what you're doing with it. And I didn't love my time at my private school, um, so five years. Uh, and so when I first came across this group, I would, and it was, I came across somewhere that the National Library, I think, had a copy of their coronation dinner menu. And last year was the coronation of Charles III. Okay, maybe there's something here, some sort of parallel. 
And I emailed Catherine Milburn here and said, by any chance, is there a copy of this, the, the coronation dinner menu? And she said, nope. And it was the minutes, which Anna has hauled out twice now to put on display. And it's a great big ledger with marbled um, end papers, and it's all cursive writing and fountain pen. And whoever compiled these minutes was very particular and put in their, all their menus with sellotape, which makes Anna's toes cool. Um, but they're all in there nevertheless, um, from their various um, annual dinners. And when I got up to 1953, it had the coronation <laughs> dinner. So I was like, oh, yes. <laughs> and it's also full of the, the language and how they might have spoken and, and their attitudes. If you saw establishment, the character, something like that, this, this other man who we sponsored and came in a school tie and how unfitting that was for a coronation dinner. Because somewhere in the minutes it was stated that when they have their monthly um, friendly social intercourse at the Vedic for lunch, over luncheon, they were to wear their school ties. So you get little bits like that that can um, build in to the to the bigger picture. In the establishment monologue, the character refers to their inaugural dinner and says they uh, part of the menu was cheese straws. And I was going back through some of my um, pictures I'd taken, including this, and I've sort of cut it out. And it's a savoury, I don't speak French, Pelle au Parmesan, whatever. And I thought, what is that? And it's just French for cheese straws. <laughs> and for some reason, <laughs> for several years, it was just cheese straws, cheese straws, and then they decided to go with the French translation. Yeah. So that's them. Okay. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So this relates to the Glasgow restaurant monologue, which was the second to last. And for those of you who haven't heard about this before, am I too far away from the microphone? Okay. I told you I'd wonder. Um, <laughs> This became my Moby Dick, in a way. I've never read Moby Dick, by the way. Um, because I couldn't locate for myself clearly where actually was the Glasgow restaurant. There was a time in the late 19th century where there was operating the Glasgow restaurant, the Glasgow Pie House, and the Glasgow Hotel, and they were different establishments. So there was a bit of confusion, and um, Dave Murray had it said that it was there, it was a Murray place. And I, yeah, okay, but I need, I need to see it. And I was sort of going through pictures, and so many of the, the photographic evidence of that period is of, can you guess what part of town? Yeah, and the exchange. There's so many photos of it, but so little showing the skyline, this area. It's even really frustrating. And then I was in here one day and one of the librarians, I can't remember his name, sorry, he said, you could try looking at fire plan maps, which I was not familiar with, and you pull them out I cut it off. I have just up there on that fire plan map. It's all in my notes. It's in my annotated version of the script that's in the hocket. Um, I could see the Glasgow, but around the corner here, which I have kept in, were these Turkish baths, which I wasn't really familiar with. I don't know a great deal about Turkish bath culture. Um, I understand that Bath Street is called Bath Street because uh -huh. there were baths there. Someone shared a photo on one of the Dunedin Reminiscence Facebook pages the other day of the Turkish baths uh -huh. in Bath Street. 
And why I was interested in this is I, while the, the monologue is focused on the Glasgow and whoever would be telling the stories there, I was trying to form a picture of who would be these people living at the Glasgow. So um, there were a number of long-term residents. It wasn't just a short-term uh, hotel type situation. And I guess it's where people, how people would have lived back in them days, um, because people didn't really flat or to live on their, their own and such. So there was a really interesting mix of people who lived there who I actually learned most about was searching through inquests. Um, just for that monologue. I had also been thinking about well, what what sort of jobs might someone do? You could be living at the Glasgow. I kept coming across um, different advertisements for knees and old Otago Witness editions and such like, which I was a little bit fond of, not just because it's a Dunedin thing. We've got a couple of knees things at home. But neither of those things specifically made it in there. I um, explained to playwrights who I'm dramaturging for that all this other research you do, it's like the iceberg under the water that holds it up even though it might not end up in the thing, it's important to the story world. And this is not very original. I mean, this is a lot of really pathetic, dated, misogynistic. The top one says, really, my dear, every time I look at that new hat of yours, I can't help laughing, can't you? Then I'll put it on when the bill arrives. Mother, I want five pounds. Ask daddy for it. Ask yourself, dear. You are soon to be married and must have practice. <laughs> well, Daphne, and what are you going to do when you grow up? Oh, diet, I suppose. <laughs> Reproduced by permission of London Punch. And then there's an advertisement for Beecham's pills, which as far as I can tell is, I don't know, five types of laxative all jammed together or something. This is part of what I worked through when I was forming the Rio Grande uh, monologue, which has a woman, who was a real woman, Ella Garrett, who had her own millinery business. And how I sort of tracked her life is, or her business life, is I went through Stone's directories. So, okay, how long was she here? Where did she live? They're great for cross-referencing like that if you if you want maybe searching for someone of a particular occupation. Um, yeah, I wanted a woman in the 1930s who could feasibly have her own business, what would that be, um, and could take herself out to lunch and reading these, thought, you know, well, one thing about a hat is it doesn't matter how much weight you put on, or you eat, your hat will still fit. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, so the, the telethon um, was referred to in the Carnarvon Station piece. He talks about um, the telethon being on that night, and that's why I couldn't have a friend to come with a family dinner to Carnarvon Station because they'd all want to be watching it. I kept in the telethon reference, but what I found, and I don't remember this from my childhood, just quite how dark the the focus of the different telethons <laughs> were for like around family violence and such like. Which of course were the causes, but it, it just didn't fit in with the tone of the piece. And you think about the, the truth of a character, and how would an eight-year-old boy view the telethon? And this is sort of my final point, and then we can open it up for questions, discussion, what have you. Um, this was a really pragmatic decision. I needed some music to close out the piece, and I had originally thought, uh, also the final piece, if you haven't seen it, was the Big, big Daddy's scene. I thought Bruce Springsteen's Hungry Heart could work. It's a, it's a pop song that lots of people know. It's kind of um, on the theme. And I had put in my budget $100, for music licensing, give or take. My producer applied for the rights for Hungry Heart for a reading, which was free to attend, 30 seconds of music, 
And I said, that'll be $500, thanks. <laughs> she was like, yeah, he's not quite the working class hero, you might have thought. So that went. And then actually it was one in one of the um, workshop weekends where I started to work with a couple of the actors and the director and um, Barbara Power, who originally played the role, talking about the character and thinking, what would this teenage girl that period, what music would she like? So I think she'd really like Blondie. So I'm much Blondie track. But Atomic would be really good. Went back to HJ, my producer, and said, can you find out if we can get Atomic? She said, yes, that's $100. Well, that's kind of the whole budget for one um, piece of music. And so I had another really long hard think about, okay, I want something with the same energy, in tone as atomic. What if there was something Dunedin, Dunedin sound, even better if it was a girl band? <laughs> and that's how I ended up with a girl like her, I look blue, go purple, um, the original pressing of the record, the vinyl, is here at the Hocken. Um, we didn't use that. Um, lovely, lovely Leslie, who I know talked to the group and they actually gifted us the use of it, the reading. So that was really great. And we got to have that bit of Dunedin that last bit. Yes. So that's sort of everything I was going to talk about in a formalish way. Did anyone like to ask anything about establishment itself? What I haven't talked about, go back over anything here. Yes. Mm. Uh, I have a question about one of your first slides. Uh, this one here mm -hmm. enacted a new typeo, and I wanted to know. Um, you were talking about performance and that sort of thing, and whether enacted utopia is a, whether it is in fact enacted. So I'm arguing against Foucault here, but whether it is um, more um, like needed or necessary. Yes, because, and this is where um, the concept of heterotopia gets controversial, because people can think. Well, what can't it be applied to, really, if it's a site? And what's key to it is not the site, not just say it's this room. It's the processes that are happening in the room at any particular time and place. So there has to be some sort of an action for it to qualify as heterotopia. <laughs> um, and this is where it plays into Goffman as well. Yeah, people taking on various roles within the site. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the, these restaurants and the cafes, as marvellous as they are, and, you know, how they create this sort of alternative reality that we want to go to, we want to visit them because of that. But they wouldn't be there unless there was a need for it. You know, but, you know they, wouldn't, they wouldn't open in the morning if no one was going to turn up. Uh, yeah, but then you could say... There wouldn't be a tuberculosis sanatorium if there wasn't a need for it. So that's not a qualifier necessary for a heterotopic site. Um, or that, um, you know, uh, people who wait or serve in restaurants and cafes behave in a particular way because mm -hmm. that's kind of, it's, it's not just because it's expected of them, it's the way that it's um, a way to promote the business and have people walk in the door. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's why it's all part of it. Great. You're actually onto it. Yes. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else. <laughs> Not part of a question. But my mother was in both as patient and a nurse in the YPR sanitarium. Sanatorium. Mm -hmm. How long was she there for? Five years. 
Um, not long as a patient, but uh, longer as a nurse, perhaps between right. five and ten years. So my understanding is, I don't know if this is your mother's situation, when um, patients were deemed well enough, they could then take on Went nursing the duties. Other, they... yeah, 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 yeah. And sort of move from the ward into the, yeah. Yeah, these sort of um, huts. But, yeah, so myself, you know, born in the late 70s, the idea that you would be sent away to an institution indefinitely, not because you'd done anything bad, it wasn't a, a prison sentence, but you can't leave and you don't know how long that sentence is going to be. So Carolyn's mother's sister was at the sanatorium too. She was there for at least 12 years, I think. Wow. Uh, and there's a couple of photos we just donated a few months ago to the... Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Can you put it into context a wee bit? Because that's mm. a play you've written. Yeah. A play reading, because people may not be aware of that. Oh, no, yeah. No. Yeah. Um, it's not a great play. No, it's not. <laughs> um, but, okay, so I, I looked at it as these three institutions. This is from a theoretical, yes. theoretical standpoint. They all qualify as total institutions. Is going to we'll call them, but also heterotopia. And so, um, my God, it's messy now. My thesis was around how I use Foucault's concept of heterotopia for writing historical dramatic fictions about sites. And this was the site because when I initially came to the project, I thought, how how can a site or setting be a character as opposed to a character, usually a protagonist and story main character. But then, okay, with this approach, how can everything sort of revolve around this particular site? And over decades, it's going to change who the characters are at that site um, and, and what the site is used for. Yes, it's got parallels that they are all total institutions, but they're different types of total institutions. And also because the landscape is so distinctive <laughs> as well. And why was it thought a good place to have a tuberculosis sanatorium? It's so dry. Why was it such a good place for an open ball stall? Because it's so far from anywhere. Um, there were articles about young men who tried to escape. And there was one, the boys got all the way to the Manaburn Dam, and I'm just get by the time the tracking dogs found them, they had to take us back, feed us. Um, so it was kind of, yeah, it was quite cruel that way. And uh, think about Wikiria being in the news recently. Um, a lot of the, the young men who were sent to uh, Waipiata were sent from Wikiria. They had no Vano family connections here, their family had no way of visiting them. And who'd flown down to Mamona, driven in land. They just didn't know where the hell they were and then um, set to work on farms. And they dug the swimming pool um, that was out there. Yeah. So it's a total environment in a way, isn't it? Really? Yeah. Some built environment, but there's also the whole natural environment that's set up. And then you populate that with people for particular reasons. Yeah. And well, we might think, you know, here in 2024, many a title, you know, rail trail, beautiful, stone landscape, grand city paintings. There was one quote from a patient that I put directly into the play, which said, if I have to look at those hills anymore, I will scream. <laughs> <laughs> because that's all she saw day after day after day. You know. If there's a bit of snow, it might be exciting, but that's about it. And then just also the very different ways of how institutions used to be run approaches to medicine. So nowadays, well, let's get you up and walking, stay in bed. I don't want you here. Um, very, uh, lots of milk in their diets. <laughs> they have a line in there, your lactose intolerance doesn't exist yet. <laughs> so it's like milk, milk, milk. Um, uh, they had one of the very first 
pirate radio stations had the TV sanatorium. And now if we were sent to the Manu Toto, we could probably still go on our phones if we wanted to. So you're talking about it as the TV? Well, I talked about all but three. All three. Yeah. So like Christian. I included a bit of that as well, yeah. I sort of yeah. used that as the framing one. I didn't go into that a great deal. We we Partly know about because, that and, yeah. and they were very good. They took us this yeah. was about ten years ago. Now. Yeah. But uh, they took us around and showed us because of the link to Aaron's yeah. mother and that. Yeah. And we so you prepared the three. Yeah. Did they show you because when I last went there and someone very kindly showed us around um some of the isolation cells where the boys put if they misbehaved and still had the graffiti and their names mm -hmm. on the wall. That just seems to yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I just want to get back. Oh yeah, get back. Yeah. Yep. Um did you consider putting uh, Cherry Court into the establishment? No, I don't think I'm familiar with Cherry Court. Oh, probably not old enough. <laughs> I'm not old enough for most of them. Sweet. Um, it's now Buddhist sticks. It's, yes. And the motels at the back have been separated from it. Oh, it's a big oh yeah. With cherry blossoms. There's a cherry blossoms so on, on the inside. Isn't the old the uh, Church of Christ building? The, 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 the turret, the town, yeah. on the corner of um, where the 24 hour deer park Yeah, that's right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, enough things have got sliced in and out. I've talked about this before. So there's a monologue with the three coffee shops. Yes. Stewart's, Little Hut, and Hobnob. And I have put Stuart's, I think, Little Hut in my application. And I thought, I've got to have cheese rolls. Yes. <laughs> but it wasn't enough. I like, well, I don't have the two. I'm saying something else. And so I set that aside. Maybe I just can't do it. Everyone knows cheese rolls. Can't live up to my name as cheese rolls anyway. And Louise, you sent an email one day and you just mentioned Hobnob in it. It was when the boots. A uh, research person was here from Nottingham. Yeah. And then thinking about patterns, wait up, I've got three downstairs coffee shops that opened at the, that operated at the same time. And that in itself presents a certain culture as the piece mm -hmm. did, uh, set in the late 1960s and the the, the girl in it, sort of a Mary Quant model wannabe, but she's too straight laced and awkward. Um, and yeah, so it just sort of grew from there. Sometimes you just need that little spark or thing that just clicks it into place. And I did an interview with ODT that was published last year. And just by chance, someone who's known me since I was really young, there was no mention of Hobnob in the uh, interview. He emailed me, say, 7 o'clock that morning. Somebody just read the paper. <laughs> he said, oh, this looks great. By the way, um, my dad owned and ran a couple of coffee shops, and if you're interested, um, one was Hobnob. Was like, <laughs> 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 like a big call. And he also just happened to be, you know, sorting through his dad's photos. So that was really nice. Got some nice images from that. Yes, yeah. Did you start with a place in each of them and then find a person to inhabit it? Or like you talked a little bit about the milk 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 milk. Yeah. Who could be eating lunch? I would say Does it, I found the matching up fantastic. Like yeah. the human stories that you use to kind of put that to you know, see where the main point in some ways for me. Yeah. Like, yeah. Thank you. Um I predominantly the place. But then it had to be evenly matched with the person. I would say the one that really stood out, that not being the place first because I put it aside was Savoy, and then coming across the public schools. Yeah. Oh, okay. And, all of them. and most of their meals were at Wayne's. And this this was an opportunity also to show a different aspect of Savoy. Um, um and she was here. Um, so they talk about having they had the dinner in the Tudor room. So they very specifically held that dinner there and then. 
whereas ordinarily um, they would be elsewhere. Yeah, for the most part with the place, and then there was the trickier sort of dramaturgical back and forth was, okay, who's the right person for the place that contrasts with the other ones? And also, can I find out sufficient about them? Is there something here? Yes, there was quite a bit about the brass band ladies, <laughs> but it didn't really blow my trumpet, so. <laughs> there, there's a good on them, good on them, great, good. Someone else's play. Can you tell us a little bit more about the sort of people that stay in the Glasgow Hotel? Oh, okay. The end. Yes. Equally important from the sort of work you do. Yeah. Was there anything particular about their food? I mean, I'm trying to think, you know, Sorry. Scottish food, fried <laughs> uh, <laughs> porridge, <laughs> and, and, and oak, oak cakes and so Yeah, on. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, on food, I'll just quickly divert back to uh, Vedic which I said in 1944, because I had come across, I would go through papers past, quite a bit, but all sort of advertisements would come up and such like, and, and they would often give me a lead for something I could dig for further here. And relating to feed, I, I came across lots of advertisements saying, your meat ration coupons won't be needed here. And I was like, huh. So I knew there would have been rationing, but I didn't really know the nuts and bolts of how that worked and so I did some digging around that, um, learned that meat rationing wasn't brought in until later, um, the, the ration amount um, was still more than the, the recommended healthy amount you need to have in 2024, uh, but the way they got around it is most of the meat rationing were applied to say roasted joints and such like, but rabbit wasn't, meat rationing didn't apply to that. And I, I know we don't really serve rabbits now. I think you can sometimes in a lot of niche places. Um, and so how did it come to be that, you know, rabbit isn't just commonly served anymore? Um, and now I'm really scratching my memory. I think it was the late 60s. There was a law brought in because there's really enough rabbits. <laughs> People farming more rabbits. So that couldn't really be a commercial thing anymore. So that was... That. So that became a real focus of that piece. With the Glasgow, so I was actually able to find out quite a lot from the food uh, that was served there because the advertisements were sort of include um, menus and the actor at the start who plays the night watchman, which was a, a real job they had there and an advertisement for a night watchman role, um, he recites this poem at the start that was in a lot of uh, ads for the Glasgow about how people would behave and it was essentially a dry house. And I had this character as a Scottish um, character uh, played by Phil Grieve, who I think did a very good Scottish accent. Um, and but I took another kind of approach with the food because... I mentioned earlier that when I was trying to find out more information about the Glasgow, what came up a lot were inquests. And it struck me this group of people, in contrast to many of the other establishments, they wouldn't choose to dine together. But like a sanatorium, it was those circumstances beyond their control that has brought them together. And they're also, I'm generalising here, not people that there's be a great many sort of public records about them. They're not in the public schoolboys, you know, <laughs> minutes. Some of them did come across like sort of remittance men, but um, yeah, their, their lives are just sort of sad. When they're turning too sad, I'd also come across a, quite a few. Um, pieces about how the Burns Club, and I think they should do this again, because we'll be people excited, um, used to do these Halloween um, evenings, well, they're probably guising and uh, uh, carving of neeps, and I learned about the Furak, which I had come across before. You don't know, you know about Furak? No? So it, it's a Halloween dish, Scotland, which, it's like a lot of cream and oats, sort of a pudding thing. Mm -hmm. And there would be 
four different trinkets in there. And so there was a ring, symbol, a button, and a coin. And they're all sort of in it. And the idea is that you scoop into the furak with your spoon, and whichever trinket you fish out, uh, that's meant to sort of foretell your, you know, your future for the coming year. So if you get the ring, you're going to be married, uh, coin, good fortune, I don't even want a button. But they are all sort of good things. And then there are a lot, I had quite a few inquest notes, and but I could line them up with these various characters, and it was a way into telling their stories. But here's an aspect of the Burns club celebrations that doesn't, as far as I'm aware, doesn't exist anymore. But it was also a way of introducing these characters that wasn't just going to see their lives were sad and tragic, but also, you know, referring back to their immigrant past, with their parents' immigrant past, and they're part of it. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyone else? Last question. Did you come across some cow's coffee shop? Because that was around in the seventies and seventeenth Street. In fact, it survived up until the mid eighties. Because you're the Pablo, but I think it's like the Pablo and Hanover Street. Mm -hmm. um, Cows, up some um, up cows, and cows, and they have some things across the road. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's across the road from Pinot. It's, yeah. and, um, no, it's right. an old hotel building, yeah, mm -hmm. and it was demolished in the late 80s. And, um, they do hot yoga now, <laughs> and funny enough, when they rebuilt the new building, they did actually include a tiny wee segment on the street level for a small coffee yeah. shop or whatever. So, very uh, self that's have operated the yeah, yeah, now, yeah. cows was much bigger. Yes. Yes. Much, much bigger. They were well when I was a teenager, we went there, but hot chocolate and their chocolate cake, yeah. <laughs> which was served with whipped cream. Yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure they did see that. Yeah. 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 Trevor Miller bought the Pat Lover side. Right. Yeah. That's how separate. Yeah, no, it's one of those. Still going. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually, <laughs> actually on the front. I went in there in 1987, that's right, when they were shutting it down. And um, I went in there just after it closed and met the, the lady who was proposing to all that for me. Because they still had the print of Fleet Street in London on a rainy day. Mm -hmm. And she said, Oh, it's my, my son's got it in his bedroom. Oh, Oh, did you want it? And I said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> So we arranged that we met the next day, yeah. and I bought it from them. I still got it. It's very cool. And, and I also bought one of the little uh, tables, and these little wooden round oh, tables, table. and two of the chairs. Oh, I still yeah. got those. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so there we are. I just yeah. wanted to come across no, the at all. Yeah. But that reminded me a bit, I'll share one last anecdote with you. Um, I didn't know which one to include, but I decided early on I really wanted to include a Chinese restaurant. Yeah. Really yeah. And um, Dave Murray suggested several. And one of the reasons I settled on August Moon was the geographical spread. So many of the ones they had were like around the Octagon or Exchange area. Well, that one's a bit north. Um, I was able to interview the daughter of the owners who spent much of her childhood living above mm -hmm. there. Um, the grandparents lived there as well. And then she owned with her husband while well before they sold it on. Um, she explained that the original carved panels from Hong Kong that her father had brought over was still in there. So it's now the friendly premier. So she said, just go in there and ask if you can take a photo. And I went in there one day and sort of, um, sort of tried to explain what I was doing and what I would she mind if I I just want photos of the panels, nothing else. I would credit her. She'd be invited along. And I think she just misunderstood 
that I was trying to claim that she didn't own the panels oh. and that oh. they should be handed. I said, no, 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 I'm not trying to take your panels. <laughs> photos and then my images aren't great because I am quite short and they're very high up but I got them thank you um but yeah if you go in there they are the original panels from the 1970s oh wow oh, yeah okay thank you very much <laughs> Thank you so much. That was fascinating, particularly for a failed actor. He ended up becoming a historian. And I, you know, I found myself thinking, and I also played very badly in the brass band. <laughs> so I, I, I understand. But, you know, I, I have this kind of slightly peculiar attitude towards brass bands still. And, uh, if they're very really good, great, from a long time. And we would be great. Just as low as you could go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that could you. <laughs> uh, so I just want to thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Completely different kind of subject. It's, it's a very original research basis, I think, that you're working on. And, and it was fascinating to hear. I love the way, the story myself, that, that you uh, use so many different sources and somehow or other manages would mix them together to use a terrible you know, cooking metaphor. But but you, you did that really well. And uh, I, did, I just think it's a super project and may you keep going and here's a little something that will force you away from reading things that are too theoretical. <laughs> It's been a real honor. Thank you. Thank you.